Okay, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hello, I am Dana Seitler, and I'm the director of the Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies at the University of Toronto. The Bonham Center is located on the territory of the Huron Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This means that we are all treaty peoples and are responsible for honoring and upholding these agreements. We are grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this territory and to share space with all of you today. And so I welcome you to the second annual Martha L. A. McCain Postdoctoral Fellowship Lecture. The Bonham Center established this fellowship in 2019 to support emerging scholars pursuing research in queer and trans studies. We were able to do so as a result of the generous support of Martha McCain, and for that, we thank her. Every year, the McCain Postdoctoral Fellow is invited to deliver a public lecture that highlights their work. And this year, we have the privilege to hear from Elif Sari. Uh, thanks to everyone that helped make the event possible, Victoria Liao, Nikolai Atai, and um, uh, Valley Wedek in particular. Elif Sari has a PhD in anthropology from Cornell University. Her dissertation titled Waiting in Transit, the Sexuality of Immobility and Iranian LGBTQ Refugees in Turkey draws on two years of ethnographic research in Turkey with Iranian LGBTQ refugees who applied for asylum on the ground of gender and sexuality based violence they faced in Iran. Through participant observation, archival research, and interviews with refugees, asylum authorities, and aid providers in three Turkish towns, Sari's work investigates the everyday life of LGBTQ asylum in this precarious and, under, and undeter, excuse me, undetermined period of waiting. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sari, whose presentation today is titled Stuck, Iranian LGBTQ Refugees in Turkey and the Sexuality of Immobility. Thank you, thank you, Dana. Well, hello everyone. I'm very excited and honored to be here. Um, when I watched the last year's postdoctoral fellowship lecture um, given by amazing Sarah Shirov, who was also the very first Martelle making postdoctoral fellow. So when I was watching Sarah's talk, I was in Turkey. Um, oh, and Sarah just joined us. <laughs> So um, they didn't hear what I said about them being great and amazing. Um, when I was watching Sarah's talk last year, I was in Turkey um, in my field site, actually, in Denizli, and writing my dissertation. And one year later, I moved to Toronto for the same position. And I have found a very supportive and intellectually and politically inspiring community here. So I want to thank my friends and colleagues from Sexual Diversity Studies and Queer and Trans Research Lab, and as well as the amazing students in my Queer in Mobilities course. And I also want to thank my um, research interlocutors and friends from the refugee community who have supported this research. And of course, thanks everyone um, so much for being here. So my talk today will um, provide an overview of my current book project about the transnational queer and trans asylum from the Middle East to North America via Turkey. And this uh, work is based on the ethnographic research um, that Dana mentioned um, that I conducted for my dissertation, as well as my ongoing um, community engagements and personal relationships with Iranian LGBTQ refugees in Turkey and also in diasporas. As we all know, in international media and international politics, Turkey is portrayed as this country that hosts the world's largest refugee population, because um, currently there are close to 6 million displaced people in the country. But in reality, and what most people don't know about Turkey is that Turkey doesn't provide long-term settlement or permanent legal status to refugees, rather, in the transnational asylum system, it works as a transit country that, um, so, so refugees go to Turkey and apply for asylum and they wait in Turkey until the United Nations Refugee Agency, UNHCR, 
resettles them to a third country, um, either in North America or in Europe. So um, let me um, share my screen and show this uh, visual that illustrates the transnational configuration um, of asylum in Turkey. So this Farsi sketch was drawn by the director of an Iranian um, diasporic queer NGO based um, here in Toronto, who frequently visits Turkey to inform refugees about asylum processes. And I translated it for you. So here on the left-hand side, we have the UNHCR and on the right, um, the Turkish state. And refugees need to follow um, and legitimize their asylum claims with both of these authorities. And once they complete these long and complicated asylum interview processes and obtain legal recognition, UNHCR refers their files to the third countries, uh, which you see on the middle bottom of this sketch. And the third countries are not legally obliged to accept refugees. So the applicants have to go through additional interviews, medical examinations and security screenings to become eligible for resettlement in these countries. Until relatively recently, this transnational system used to recognize LGBTQ refugees as a particularly vulnerable group um, because of their non-normative genders and sexualities. And this assumed vulnerability used to make them a prioritized group among other refugee groups. And what I mean by prioritization is that the UNHCR used to process their asylum claims on a much faster track than other refugee groups. And more importantly, the United States and Canada used to reserve um, prioritized refugee quotas for LGBTQ applicants and used to expedite their resettlement processes. So I had started to think about the questions of sexuality and migration uh, within that context in which LGBT, Iranian LGBTQ refugees were called the golden cases of the refugee population in Turkey. However, um, soon after I started my research in 2014, 2015, this picture has changed drastically in line with global border closures, um, especially in the wake of the so-called um, refugee crisis and the rise of right-wing, white supremacist, Islamophobic and anti-immigrant governments across the world. So for instance, in 2015, Canada um, has begun to implement new resettlement quotas for uh, refugees from Syria. And this was how the Canadian state responded to the refugee crisis. But at the same time, Canada has simultaneously stopped accepting any new LGBTQ refugees. And with this abrupt, and I'm gonna say violent policy change, Canada has become an impossible destination for Middle Eastern Iranian um, LGBTQ refugees who used to go there or who used to come here just within a year. Another um, resettlement country for queer and trans um, refugees has typically been the United States. But in 2017, with the Trump administration's executive order, um, which has gained instant infamy as the Muslim travel ban, refugee resettlement from predominantly Muslim countries like Iran has been suspended indefinitely. And the Biden administration lifted the ban last year, but, um, but I can say that um, the refugee resettlement rates to US are still very low and this whole process of resettlement has become much more securitized than ever. As a result of these um, restricting border policies, the vast majority of my interlocutors, um, even those who applied for asylum and completed all necessary procedures as early as 2014, are still in Turkey. So they have entered their eighth year and they are still waiting without knowing, you know, um, when they would be resettled and which country would accept them. Reflecting on this ongoing waiting, my interlocutors sarcastically joke that golden cases have become plastic cases abandoned in Turkey for an undetermined period of time. So, so to um, give you a better sense of this abandonment, over the course of two years of fieldwork between 2017 and 19, 
only one person among hundreds of refugees I got to know was resettled to the United States, and only seven people were resettled to Canada. And notably, uh, four of those seven people were resettled not through the state, but with private uh, refugee sponsorship programs. And this year, um, I have begun to conduct research about those uh, programs in Toronto, and um, I can talk more about them during the Q&A. My ethnography looks at this critical time period in which the prioritization has turned into abandonment. Golden cases have become plastic cases, and the temporary transit via Turkey has turned into a condition of what refugees call stuckness in Turkey. So I studied queer migration, not so much through movement and mobility, but through the structures of confinement, waiting, and immobility. Migration studies um, have predominantly taken mobility as the norm and waiting as an exception to this norm. And my research departs from this analytical and methodological privileging of mobility. And in this book project, I try to develop an understanding of migration that foregrounds the experiences of waiting um, and confinement rather than movement in the current context of closed borders. In my work, I approach waiting in three ways, as a state-sanctioned form of mobile immobility, as a lived and felt experience, and as a method. So part of my research explores these transnational structures that make refugees linger in Turkey with uncertain status. And through this particular location of Turkey, I also theorize about a larger pattern, um, which is you know, how the states and asylum regimes use waiting and uncertainty um, as a way to prevent refugees uh, from immigration, resettlement, and citizenship in global north, and rather to keep them in so-called transit countries like Turkey, Jordan, and Kenya, as well as in other liminal zones of um, waiting and confinement, um, like refugee camps and detention centers across global south. Um, but as Dana mentioned, I, um, I'm an anthropologist, so um, as an ethnographer who is particularly invested in uh, feminist and queer methodologies, um, I'm interested in understanding not only the structures and processes, but also how people live within those structures and what those structures do to people. That's why I approach baiting not only as a governmental tool, as a kind of like state sanctioned form of immobility, but also as a lived and felt experience. So I explore how this notion of stuckness um, is produced in refugees' everyday lives. And I particularly focus on um, how refugees cope with this uncertain and precarious form of baiting, how they maintain hope for a more desirable future and what kinds of lives they create and what, kind of, what kinds of queer socialities they establish um, as they wait in Turkey. So to answer these questions, I um, conducted ethnographic um, research in Turkey and my main field site uh, was Denizli. So I would like to show it to you. So here you can see Denizli with the red pin um, on the map. When they apply for asylum, um, the Turkish state assigns refugees to small towns located mostly in the interior of the country. And um, Denizli is one of them, and it hosts the largest LGBTQ refugee population in the country. So in these cities, refugees live side by side with local townspeople. They rent their own apartments. And although they don't have work permits, most of them work informally in um, textile factories, construction and agricultural sites, and in the service sector. And although they actively participate in the socioeconomic life, refugees also keep a low profile in those cities and hide or try to hide their LGBTQ identities to protect themselves from possible homophobic and transphobic violence. Refugees also have restricted mobility in the small towns. 
So they have to sign in um, at the local asylum offices, either by giving fingerprints or by scanning their faces every week. They also cannot leave their cities without travel permits issued by those um, asylum authorities. And any missing signatures or even a short trip to a nearby town um, puts them at the risk of deportation. These carceral technologies like travel permits, signature duties, biometric identification technologies, and the constant threat of deportation play an important role in the production of this notion of stuckness. And I want to emphasize that they produce stuckness not only through space and spatial confinement, but also through the affective structures of unbelonging and criminalization. The constant surveillance and securitization of everyday life make refugees feel criminalized and, and it make, makes it harder for them to cultivate a sense of belonging. This affective dimension becomes more visible when we think about how refugees perceive their confinement in small towns as a punishment, and more importantly, how they describe their lives through prison and slavery metaphors. For instance, one day as we were walking to the asylum office for the signature duty, one of my interlocutors told me, and I quote, this is modern slavery, you know, like how they group slaves and chain them together so that they wouldn't escape. They force us to give signatures every week so we wouldn't escape from our city. End of quote. So this is only one example among many encounters I had in which um, refugees describe themselves as prisoners or slaves, their lives in Turkey as imprisonment or stuckness, and their cities as open air prisons. And as you can see in these images, um, such prison metaphors are also frequently used in the, in the materials that refugees prepare for, um, you know, protest, political protests, social media campaigns, as well as in their artwork. In most academic works and public imagination, camp refugees and urban refugees are portrayed as two separate and different entities, and, and even worse, we rarely see any connections made between refugee populations and other incarcerated groups like prisoners and detainees. Turkey's settlement policy challenges these binaries between the camp and the city or closed spaces or and open spaces. Turkey doesn't confine refugees in camps or detention centers, but it restricts their freedom of movement through various surveillance and security measures and extra legal means like deportation. And that's why I find it very important to take seriously refugees' own frameworks of open air prison and stuckness because these self descriptions urge us to, to um, analyze how, in our contemporary world, the city, the camp, and the prison are increasingly evolving into each other, borrowing from each other and ultimately they are creating new socio-spatial formations for confining and controlling marginalized and dispossessed communities. In addition to these spatial and affective structures that produce the city as a carceral space, the notion of stuckness is also inseparably linked to time and temporalities of waiting. The flow of time in this small town, Denizli, was punctuated by multiple forms of waiting that refugees experience on a daily basis. Waiting for interview appointments or interview results and checking one's phone every five minutes to see if there is an update. Waiting in NGO offices for submitting a petition or as you see in these images, getting in long lines in front of the asylum office at 3 p.m., I'm sorry, at 3 a.m., and waiting there until 2 p.m. the next day to obtain a travel permit or to complete the signature duty. So throughout my research, I also participated in these different forms of waiting, and the waiting has also become a method that shaped the temporal, spatial, and affective arrangements of my research. In addition to these intentional 
instances of baiting with refugees, I also accompanied them to public offices, participated in their everyday lives and involved in their communal and political organizing. As part of my research, I um, also work in a small textile factory, which uh, mostly employs LGBTQ refugees. And um, so this photo is, our, is uh, from our workplace and I took it during the break uh, because we were not allowed to use cell phones during the work shift. And here I gained an embodied experience of working in the textile industry, which is the main source of informal employment for LGBTQ refugees. And finally, um, as I talk about my methodological orientations, I also want to say um, a few words about my positionality. Uh, so in the field, I was out as a queer lesbian woman and most of my interlocutors introduced me to other LGBTQ refugees as Beche Khodemun, which is a Farsi phrasing that translates as our kid or one of us. In my case, Beche Khodemun, or she's one of us, referred to our shared daily engagements, you know, like our shared practices of dating and living together, but also to our shared sexual identifications. And furthermore, my activist identity and researcher identity often merge together, or maybe they were never that separate from the beginning. And this created deeper relations of trust and solidarity between us. And of course, it also introduced um, deeper layers of tension and conflict, and we can um, discuss them after the talk um, if, if anyone is interested. So through these methodologies, um, I came to answer these questions of um, how refugees navigate this system and how they cope with uncertain and precarious waiting in three central ways. And now I would like to unpack um, these frameworks that I'm working on um, for this um, book project. And I wanna start with the first one, identities, navigations, and self-making. So, I want to go back to this sketch to remind you that refugees in Turkey follow their asylum claims with various authorities at national, international, and diasporic scales. Although all of these authorities try to assess the, the authenticity of refugees' identities and the credibility of their claims, each of them has their own understanding of what counts as authentic queerness and what counts as deserving vulnerability. And thus, as they navigate this system, refugees encounter multiple and sometimes contradictory expectations. And they constantly reconfigure their identities to conform to these different tropes of authenticity and deservingness. For instance, one of my interlocutors, uh, whom I call Kiana, who is a self-identified um, lesbian woman who was married in Iran and who has a daughter. So once she entered the system, Kiana quickly learned how to present herself as a victim of forced marriage when she registered with the UNHCR and as a single lesbian mom when she reached out to uh, NGOs in Canada for private sponsorship. And when she applied to Turkish charity organizations, Kiana preferred to hide her lesbian identity and rather presented herself as a widow to become eligible for financial aid. This skillful navigation is a strategic move for refugees to increase their chances for recognition, resettlement, and humanitarian aid. But these navigations and the everyday experiences of dating also change the ways in which um, refugees see and perceive themselves. Most of my interlocutors mentioned that waiting in Turkey has transformed their understandings of the self and led them to a new self-knowledge, um, for Farsi speakers in the audience. I would like to illustrate this with the story of a person whom I call Aram. Aram self-identifies as queer and uses they dumb pronouns. When they registered with the UNHCR in 2014, they made their asylum claim through being a lesbian woman. Soon after they entered the refugee community in Denizli, 
they realized that they didn't like to be called Hanum, Miss, and they began to self-identify as Butch. In the following years, Aram began to think that they might be trans. And I quote from our conversation. So Aram says, I saw the first trans person in my life here in Turkey. What is trans? What is F2M? What is M2F? I learned all of them here. Then I began to think that I could be trans because I don't like to be a woman. End of quote. Aram learned how to inject themselves with testosterone shots with the help of other trans refugees because they couldn't afford to go to a doctor. And in eight months, Aram's voice and facial features uh, began to change and people began to call them Aga, Mr. Aram realized that they weren't happy with this new calling either. And eventually, through numerous conversations with other refugees that kind of like um, spread through years, they came to identify as queer. Aram described their transformational journey from lesbian to butch to trans and to queer as arriving at self-knowledge, Kochinasi Residan. So this is a form of knowledge um, which unfolded during the period of waiting in Turkey, where they met new people, entered new communities, and gathered new information and acquired new experiences that weren't possible or available in Iran. So for instance, some of these experiences are, you know, practicing living with the same sex partner, using hormones, cross-dressing, or dating in public for the first time. Black and queer diaspora scholars like Jafari Allen and Gayatri Gopinath argue that diaspora becomes a site of self-making through the emergence of new identifications, desires, and intimacies. And I suggest that waiting in Turkey becomes a similar site of emergence in which refugees not only navigate the asylum system's articulations of gender and sexuality, but also experiment new ways of being and living and cultivate new identities and identifications. And of course, these processes of self-making and becoming are not only limited to gender and sexuality. Waiting also brings other experiences and other subject positions to refugees' lives. They become NGO clients and humanitarian aid recipients. They become informal labor. They become research participants or community organizers, just to name a few. And these new engagements also transform their socioeconomic and political subjectivities. For instance, um, Kiana, whom I uh, mentioned as this um, person who navigates different identity categories, like a victim of forced marriage, a single lesbian mom, er and a widow, um, Kiana told me that waiting in Turkey has made her the strongest woman on earth. So I want to share this um, empowerment narrative with you. In Iran, I was an ordinary woman. I hadn't worked outside of home. I hadn't been abroad. I hadn't traveled alone. When I took the train to Turkey, I was afraid. A new country, a new language, a different culture, I was terrified. Then I have learned everything, how to negotiate with landlords, sorry, how to find a job, how to work, how to organize community events. Think about it. That ordinary woman has become the mother of Denizli. So um, Kiana was chosen as the mother of um, the lesbian community in Denizli, and I will talk about um, those queer kin structures in a in a second. But let me um, continue with Kiana's narrative. Now I dare to say, put me somewhere in the world, anywhere, and I know I can survive there because I have survived here. Waiting in Turkey has made me the strongest woman on earth. So now I would like to uh, move to the second framework. Uh, and with this, I also want to move us from an individual self-making process to the collective practices of kin making, community making, space making, and world making. As they wait in Turkey, refugees call cultivate what I call a queer ethics of everyday life based on shared practices of love, 
care, support, and solidarity. So I would like to illustrate um, some of these um, queer ethics with my ethnographic findings. Separated from family support and intimacy, refugees establish alternative care and support networks by forming queer kin structures. Oftentimes, refugees who have waited in Turkey for a significant period of time are chosen as the fathers and mothers, and they become responsible for finding housing and employment for the kids, um, newcomer refugees, preparing the kids for asylum interviews and helping them adapt to the social and cultural life in Turkey. And what is really important to emphasize is that these kin structures are not determined by age, gender, or sex assignment, but by waiting. That is, the longer they wait in Turkey, the more senior positions refugees get in these um, queer families, because waiting brings a mastery of the Turkish language, more familiarity with the local culture, and a deeper knowledge of the asylum system. These queer families resemble the workings of other alternative or chosen family formations that um, you might know from different contexts. For instance, I'm thinking of the ballroom culture and um, Marlon Bailey's work on um, how houses provide support for its members, especially for the children who are often poor or working class queer and trans people of color. In a similar way, the queer kin structures refugees establish in Turkey become a source of excuse me, become a source of emotional and material support as family members help each other in almost every aspect of life and share resources such as information, housing, or collective budget. Family members also help each other manage the feelings of anxiety, frustration, and hopelessness by utilizing mundane practices such as humor, dream talk, and fortune telling. For example, each time um, they drink Turkish coffee, they would read the coffee residue uh, at the bottom of their cups and offer each other a possible date for resettlement. And indeed, there is a common joke uh, among my interlocutors that you know whatever they see in their dreams or in their coffee cups, you know whether whether it's a cloud, a cat, or a hammer, they always find a way to interpret that image with the prospect of resettlement in a near future. And these intimate and seemingly non-political practices strengthen their resilience to uncertain and prolonged waiting. And finally, as they wait in Turkey, refugees also engage in communal and political organizing. So let me show you um, some photos. So this one um, is from a political demonstration that refugees organized in 2018 to protest the long waiting times. And I will come back to this um, demonstration at the end of my talk, but now I wanna emphasize that although some refugees use the kind of self-victimizing language like save Iranian refugees, um, this, when this protest was organized, the Turkey was, uh, Turkey was under an official state of emergency and the government had banned all political protests. So refugees organized this demonstration by both resisting the state and by risking deportation. And this one is from a workshop um, that refugees organized together with activists from Kaos GL, which is an LGBTQ association in Turkey, um, as well as with the members of the local LGBTQ group in Denizli. And here, one of the slogans they painted on the sign says, um, LGBTI solidarity will dismantle borders. Okay, so this one has a very interesting story. In 2017, the Turkish government, in addition to um, the state of emergency, it also uh, issued an LGBTI ban, which has restricted all LGBTI events and gatherings. So not just protests, but also you know, parties and sociocultural events. And here we see a group of um, refugees together with activists from Heavy, which is another LGBTQ organization, um, gathering together, gathering on a boat 
and celebrating the May 17th International Day Against uh, Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia. And I'm really impressed by the creativity and resistance in this story because, you know, they circumvented the state's LGBTI ban by renting a ferry and making a space for themselves on water. And this one is um, from a communal picnic that refugees organized um, with activists from Pink Life, which is another association in Turkey that was founded by trans women and sex workers. And again, this photo was taken during the LGBTI ban. And I remember how we went to the uh, most remote corner of the park um, away from picnic tables to kind of, you know, avoid conflict with the park security and to be able to ourselves. So there is um, a lot to say about these photos. To me, the collectivity and joy in these pictures is a manifestation of how refugees and how queers are able to create ephemeral moments of joy, pleasure, intimacy, and togetherness, even under most restrictive environments. When I look at these photos, I also think about how refugees occupy otherwise heteronormative spaces and temporarily turn them into queer spaces through sensorial, affective, and embodied space-making and world-making practices. And by doing so, they resist the carceral regimes that mark their bodies and practices as out of place, both physically and material, uh, metaphorically, in Sarah Ahmed's words. Another thing that excites me in these photos is the kinds of collaborations, conversations, and connections that emerge between refugees and local and national LGBTQ groups. And as someone from Turkey, um, I'm very happy to see how these translocal alliances are also transforming Turkey's LGBTQ groups and women in very significant ways. And, and you know how they um, have been encouraging and challenging all of us um, to include the questions of race, migration, and citizenship in our cultural and political programming. Together, these queer ethics of everyday life reveal that Waiting is not merely a governmental tool that aims to control and demobilize refugees, and it's definitely not an empty, meaningless time in which nothing happens or in which nothing interesting happens. So these two are the dominant representations of waiting in the literature. My research demonstrates that refugees turn waiting into an active time and space in which they refashion their identities form queer kin structures, establish translocal alliances, and cultivate new practices of support and solidarity. However, by arguing this, I also try to avoid romanticizing the notions of refugee resistance or queer solidarity and a kind of monolithic understanding of community. The very violence and uncertainty of waiting, which encourage refugees to establish a collective ethics of living together, also prompt them to, to feel intense competition with other refugee groups, as well as with each other, um, for having access to limited resources. And this brings me to the final framework um, of my research, which is solidarity and competition. So as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, the transnational asylum system recognizes LGBTQ refugees as a vulnerable group, but this vulnerability doesn't come with faster or prioritize um, resettlement anymore. Within this new economy of abandonment and stuckness, LGBTQ refugees mobilize various strategies to regain their golden, their previous golden case status. For instance, in public demonstrations and social media campaigns, they often use images of victimhood, vulnerability, and suffering. And they also employ homonationalist and colonial rescue narratives that glorify the sexual rights and freedoms in resettlement countries and asking these countries to, to help refugees, to save them. 
And second, refugees not only emphasize their vulnerabilities, but also locate that vulnerability within a comparative and competitive framework. And this framework is formed around the figure of Syrian refugees, whom they perceive as the new golden cases, especially after Canada began to prioritize Syrian refugee resettlement. For example, in a community meeting before that um, 2018 protest, one of the organizers said, and I quote, Syrians are victims of war, and we all know that their conditions are very difficult. But there is one thing we need to emphasize. Syrians escaped from war, and now they live in Turkey. There is no war here, and they are safe. But we escaped from homophobia, and Turkey is not any different than Iran. So we really don't have any life security here. That's why we should keep reminding the world that there are more dangerous situations than war, bombs, and torture. End of quote. Following this community meeting, refugees collectively drafted a petition. And one thing that petition did was to establish a stark comparison between homophobia and war. So um, I want to read that part from the petition. LGBT refugees haven't faced wars and bombs thrown on them, but isn't the torture and persecution we have faced since our childhood enough to break us? UNHCR is prioritizing Syrian refugees who are safing in these homophobic countries than us. Prioritizing other refugees doesn't have to come at the cost of our lives. So through this comparison between homophobia and war, Iranian LGBTQ refugees portray themselves as a more vulnerable and more deserving community who should be resettled on a faster track than other refugee groups like Syrians. However, when it comes to the question of who from within the community needs to be or deserves to be resettled, in-group differences, identity distinctions, and socioeconomic hierarchies come into play, uh, and they generate feelings and practices of policing, gatekeeping, and competition among LGBTQ refugees themselves. So one of the issues I explore in the book is um, what I call the fake case problem, uh, which refers to how refugees judge and police each other's sexualities to determine who is really LGBTQ and who is the fake case, uh, meaning you know um, who pretends, who is pretending to be LGBTQ only for asylum purposes. These discourses of authenticity and fakeness are often shaped around on homonormative notions of class, race, age, and disability, and those who are not familiar with or those who do not conform to these norms might easily be labeled as fake and excluded from their communities. During my fieldwork, I met several uh, feminist and queer scholars and activists who were surprised by or frustrated at refugees' invest investment in these hierarchies between real and fake cases or deserving and undeserving refugees. I also shared similar feelings of um, disappointment and frustration, especially in the earlier phases of my research. However, what is important to understand and what took me years to understand is that Refugees are not policing each other's sexualities or vulnerabilities per se, but rather policing others' access to resources, especially the main resource, which is resettlement, by way of judging whether or not somebody is really queer or really suffering. So what is at stake is not so much um, sexuality or vulnerability policing, but rather it is a question of access. As a way of closing, I want to offer um, a self-reflexive approach because I believe that our disappointment or frustration tell a lot about the idealizing and romanticizing expectations we have about particular communities such as queer refugees. <clears throat> I mean, of course, there is nothing wrong with being disturbed by you know, individualism, gatekeeping, or competition. But it seems to me that people, including myself, 
were not merely disturbed by those practices, but by their coexistence with other things, better things like joy, um, community, hope, solidarity, resistance. This coexistence made my interlocutors ambiguous figures. They are resistant, resilient, supportive, transgressive queers who also attach themselves to normative politics and exclusionary practices. So by juxtaposing these conflicting practices and feelings together and by locating them within the competitive economy of asylum, my work provides a new theorization of the relationship between migration, sexuality, and waiting. I argue that the carceral politics of asylum with long and uncertain waiting times, restricted mobility, and unequal distribution of power, privilege, and access both necessitate and make difficult to establish intimate attachments, queer ethics, and emergent solidarities. In other words, stuckness encourages refugees to establish communal ties to cope with violence, poverty, and hopelessness, but at the same time, it also pits them against one another for having access to scarce resources. This new theorization urges us to challenge the stabilizing and comforting binaries like good people and bad people, victims and heroes, or normative politics versus transgressive politics. Real life is messier and more complicated than these binaries. And if there is one thing um, I learned through this research, it is that solidarity and competition, support and gatekeeping, and collectivity and individual salvation can and do coexist LGBTQ refugees. And I'm sure many people in this meeting are familiar uh, with, the, with the kind of coexistence of um, such practices of solidarity and competition uh, within academia, which I find very similar to asylum and resettlement regimes because it also works through quotas, vulnerability categories and identity distinctions and creates um, structures of competition for access to limited grants, fellowships and jobs. And as much as it can be uncomfortable, I believe that our task should be to understand why, how, and under what conditions certain communities like refugees, graduate students, or early career scholars have to experience these contradictory, conflicting practices um, hand in hand. Well, thank you so much for listening. I'm eager to hear your comments and questions. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for that brilliant work, Elif. I can't wait for us to, you know, just unpack and debrief. And uh, it reminds me so much of the work I'm doing as well. So I'm happy to be in conversation with you this evening. And um, so I will, my name is Nikolai Atai, and I am the program coordinator for the Queer and Trans Research Lab. And I, my task this evening is really to just moderate. So um, I will invite, invite you to feel free to put on your camera if you could um, to ask and leave questions and to just engage in conversation. You could also feel free to use the uh, raise hand function or the chat and I could uh, moderate questions coming in the chat as well. So feel free to jump in and uh, let's have a really engaging conversation. So I see the first person is Chell. So Chell, feel free to jump in. Hey, yeah, sorry, I'm not like, camera presentable, but um, I'm super excited to have listened to this talk. It was super, super thought, super thought provoking. And um, I guess like my question is kind of um, like, I'm really fascinated by this analogy of like our cases turn from golden to plastic. And like, I think um, I'm curious about what you think about that. Cause it sounds like um, while there is a profound sense of like immobility, there's also like a lot of mobility that's happening. And like, uh, queer, queer folks are like mobilizing and you know engaging in I guess and actions and um behaviors that I guess I wouldn't necessarily like uh categorize as like so stable through the words of plastic so I guess like uh what do you think about that thank you Shal. yeah this is um 
this is an analogy that 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 really um, kind of stood out for me for years, like since I first heard this term, and I think it really refers to this like economy of asylum that um, you know differentiates uh, different groups based on their assumed vulnerabilities or assumed differences and grants them differential access to resources like mobility, resettlement, and humanitarian aid. And this shift from golden to plastic definitely kind of refers to and implies refugees' feelings of being abandoned, both socially and materially, um, by the asylum regimes and asylum regimes and humanitarian regimes that kind of used to prioritize them. And to me, this shift from golden to plastic really shows that, you know, like how the questions of who deserves to be resettled, who's, um, whose asylum claims and whose resettlement is processed on a much faster track and who is excluded from immigration and citizenship altogether um, really keep shifting with, uh, with resettlement countries, um, political, economic and security issues. And it also, also shows, you know, like how a group that was previously called golden cases can just within a matter of just a few years can become plastic in their own words. So it definitely um, contains um, a lot of emotions right here. We have like disappointment, we have frustration. We also have surprise because this is a sarcastic comment. Of course, they don't think of themselves as plastic undervalued, but uh, this shift came really unexpected and abrupt. So to me, it really reveals how these decisions um, can be made uh, very arbitrarily and abruptly by um, by the nation states and asylum regimes without any any accountability, any political accountability or justification. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. So feel free to keep the questions coming. In the time being, um, I keep going back to that image uh, you showed earlier in the presentation of the birdcage um, and that, uh, you know, just that story of movement. And I'm wondering, you know, you know, as you're saying, a lot of your uh, participants spoke about feeling trapped and uh, seeing that movement to freedom. So, but I'm wondering how much of that uh, narrative is influenced by, again, the kind of humanitarian aid industry um, and the ways that international queer human rights activism influences uh, what is happening. I'm just wondering and if that came up at all in the research. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, I think um, prison metaphors, narratives and images of prison and slavery are, um, well, on the one hand, we keep seeing them everywhere to kind of, you know, um, to to, to explore, understand, and criticize different circumstances. So like as a metaphor, they are really being used by a lot of different communities. And in this in itself might be a problem, like another metaphor, like decolonizing ban. These things are only used as metaphors. Um, there is a, and they kind of dismiss um, the structural problems there. But um, in the case of um, Iranian LGBTQ refugees, I think, um, so they definitely have this like sensational appeal to humanitarian regimes and the resettlement countries to kind of show their like stuckness in Turkey. But I think um, there are also, so I'm basically looking more into like how these notions are produced within everyday life through these like spatial, affective um, and temporal relations that refugees experience on a daily basis. So the, the wires, barbed wires, walls and cages, these images really refer to um, the spatial confinement, both in their cities, but also in Turkey. And they also refer to, you know, these affective structures of just being criminalized for being refugees in a country, as well as kind of the temporal stuckness in uncertainty, which prevents them from establishing, you know, like, um, forward moving kind of futurity. If I may jump in, um, first Ayla, thank you so much. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak more about, you were talking about your positionality in the field and how it generated um, some conflict at time as well. I was wondering if you could just speak more to that. 
Sure, absolutely. Um, well, so, okay, I mentioned that, you know, I was like really deeply engaged uh, in refugees, communal and political organizing. And I did that both as a researcher and as someone who's as a kind of political and moral agent who is really um, invested in these notions of, you know, like establishing translocal alliances and resisting against the carceral regimes. And most of the tension and conflict occurred um, during this organizing um, so one of them was um, definitely what I call this like fake case problem. So I was invited to participate in this discourse of fake cases. Uh, some of my interlocutors, for instance, warned me not to waste my time with fake cases, you know, like kind of implying that some of the people who might conduct interviews might be fakes, uh, fake LGBTQs. And sometimes I was explicitly asked whether so-and-so is, is, is is really queer or authentic or or fake and i always kind of like try to direct these like turn these conversations into a different a more productive direction like you know kind of sharing some of the things that i saw as problematic in these fake discourses or you know like our desire to know and why where that desire comes from or the difficulties or impossibilities of knowing um, someone's desire, body, or identification. And another point of tension was about, you know, these discourses that are used um, about Syrian refugees. Um, so, you know, the statements that are shared with you, like uh, Syrian refugees are safer in Turkey, um, you know, like they escaped from war and now they, there are no war conditions here. I think these statements are really debatable. Um, because, you know, first they homogenize the entire Syrian community and dismisses the exist existence of Syrian LGBTQs, right? Like establishing that um, contradiction between homophobia and war. It homogenizes the community, it erases LGBTQ Syrians, and it also dismisses the pervasive acts of violence, racism, and discrimination against Syrian refugees. Um, but unfortunately, the kinds of humanitarian politics uh, really make it difficult to make these connections between different forms of violence and between different systems of oppression that different refugee groups experience in Turkey. So I, um, so I talked about those things uh, with my interlocutors and friends a lot. So I wasn't really shy about my own political convictions and, you know, and this is um, not something we often see in research, like um, a lot of researchers kind of don't share their political opinions. Instead, they try to learn uh, their interlocutors' political opinions. And especially if there is a kind of political tension or conflict, they mostly tend to remain silent for the sake of maintaining good, good research relationships. But I guess to me, um, research is not only about like learning from interlocutors, but also kind of a, a mutual uh, and mutually empowering and transformative process. Um, and, you know, like these moments were full of tension and conflict, but they were also very productive moments in terms of like kind of shaping the political discourses we use. Thank you for that. Yeah, I love that. And it's, I was interested when you said that, because I think usually, you know, the conflict arises post publication for a lot of um, researchers who don't, you know, engage in these in these um, in very important conversations. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, well, definitely, like one thing that really bothers me in, um, in my own discipline anthropology is this like tendency to relay, delay the, the critique to post research, you know, like people have all kinds of ideas and critiques, but they wait until they publish articles or books and then the interlocutors read it and they were like, what? And I feel like, why don't we share these things on the field as we are talking to people? Why don't we give it a chance to kind of mutually transform and, and I don't know, like, you know, share the political critiques and evolve into a different direction. Uh, Monica, you have Monica. Hi, thank you so much. This was so excellent. Um, I'm just um, wondering if you could share a little bit more about sort of the racial discourses that have come up in your fieldwork and the 
um, and the analysis of, of, the, of the information as well. Um, I know you shared with us a little bit um, about the metaphors that come up in terms of how folks are speaking sort of about their experiences. You're also mentioning that a little bit in your response now as well. Thank you, Monica. Yes. Um, well, one thing I've noticed um, during my research is that, so I mentioned these different strategies that um, refugees mobilize, especially after the border closures to kind of regain their, you know, golden case status and to kind of increase their chances for resettlement. And here, at this point, I realized that they, um, some of them, not all of them, but some of them also um, emphasize their Aryan race, which is, you know, this like Aryan race myth, which kind of like divides humankind into different races and considers most Europeans as well as Iranians and Indians as the master race or the highest race. So I feel like by using this Aryan race myth, uh, some refugees try to connect themselves to the European whiteness through this like racial kinship. And I've noticed that the, these discourses of um, Aryan race really increased, um, after, especially after the, the Trump administration's Muslim travel ban, which you know targets uh, particularly racialized Muslim communities. And in most um, discourses of race, in the context of Middle East, we can't really think about race without thinking about sect and religion. So I feel like in that, uh, as refugees try to kind of connect themselves to a whiteness through this racial myth, they also try to dis disassociate themselves, to disengage from racialized Muslim communities that the Muslim travel ban particularly targeted. Thank you so much for that. Hi, Elif. Oh, sorry, Nasli. Go ahead. Didn't see your hand. Go no, ahead. No, please, you go ahead. I'll, yeah, I'll go ahead. Go after you. Please go. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for that wonderful conversation. Um, I was wonder. I was really struck by the politics of location and space that you uh, began with, where you talked about how um, the Turkish state concentrates these refugee populations, not just in small Turkish towns, but that are located in the interior of the country. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about those politics, um, especially in relationship to the way that uh, Turkey is positioned both geohistorically and geopolitically. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you. Um, yes, so um, I guess, when we think about this like particular refugee settlement, one thing, the first thing that, that we can notice is that um, refugees are targeted primarily as a, or treated as a primarily security problem because these, you know, like confining them in the interior of the country. And uh, if you look at the map, you would see that, you know, like the border um, and the coastal regions uh, do not host refugees at all. And this is a way to prevent them from migrating to Europe. And so I mentioned this um, critical um, historical political context that my work focuses on starting from 2015. And I mentioned some changes in Canada's and United States asylum policies. And during the same time, um, European Union has also done so many structural changes to securitize its borders. And one of them was to sign a deal with Turkey in 2016. So through this uh, deal, Turkey receives huge amounts of financial support, like um, close to 9 billion euros from EU. And in return, it promises to keep refugees within its borders and you know, prevent them from migrating to Europe. And this small town regulation is a way um, to, to keep them in the interior of the country. And it shows us that you know, um, this is a way to protect both Turkey's and EU's um, border securities. And another notion, another issue about security is that most of the towns that are chosen for refugee settlement themselves are um, 
Well, the Ministry of Interior, as I was like doing some archival research, I realized that Ministry of Interior calls these cities uh, unproblematic in terms of security. And when, when you wonder why, um, you realize that these cities are mostly populated by Sunni, Muslim, and Turkish communities. So, so this, and you know, refugees, linguistic, racial, ethnic, sexual, gender yeah. differences become more visible in these towns, uh, as opposed to larger cities like Istanbul, where people can be more anonymous. And I think this, you know, like this visible difference, that visibility makes it easier for the law enforcement and public authorities to surveil every aspect of refugees lives and the very same visibility also make refugees vulnerable to multiple forms of violence and racism yeah no i that's one of, i mean i thank you so much that's that's those were the kind of things that exactly i was wondering about right because you have this very particular spatialization of immobilizing refugees so th thank you that was really intriguing and um in depth thank you so much you're welcome um Nazli? hi elif thank you so much for this talk it's really refreshing to hear about like joy and compassion and like solidarity that's happening there um so my questions are like about waiting and um like um, maybe how gender and also class politics, because um, I think there are questions of class to um, factor into this experience of waiting. I'm also thinking with uh, Sima Shahzadi's work, the politics of rightful killing and um, how this waiting, do you think would impact the resettlement and uh, kind of futurities because um, it's just like a very precarious time um, so I'm just wondering your thoughts. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, um, I have a very, very long answer to this question, but I'll try to narrow it down and keep it short. So one thing I try to do in this book and one thing I try to do in the dissertation is to um, attend to the heterogeneous nature of waiting. So refugees do not only wait for resettlement, they wait for many things, they wait under a lot of different conditions. And they also experience waiting differently according to their um, sexual, class, racialized and gender position. So we are talking about like multiple forms of waiting as well as multiple emotions and multiple material conditions and everyday experiences attached to waiting. So for instance, I can give you a few examples to kind of illustrate this. In terms of gender, I think there is a very big difference be between cis waiting and trans waiting. So I'm still thinking about this. I'm talking with friends um, and I'm trying to wrap my head around this question. So I think waiting has a different kind of material and emotional toll on trans folks who, for whom resettlement in a third country might mean free access to hormones, better medical opportunities, uh, and, or, you know, like um, sex confirmation, sex uh, affirmation surgery. And waiting in Turkey might mean um, to kind of keep suppressing their um, desire to transition, especially in the small towns where it's not really possible to experiment many things they, that they want to do. In terms of class, I think, again, there is a really big difference emotionally and materially about like people uh, who are from upper middle um, class positions or from like relatively more privileged positions and those who do not have any financial support whatsoever. So their waiting conditions also change a lot and waiting means different things to them. A lot of people work in textile factories and they always talk about how these like long years of waiting, like working in this like draining, exhausting work, like um, 10, 12 hours a day uh, with no off days um, and how it's kind of, you know, creates a lot of injuries and harms for their bodies and for their psyche, while there are also folks who haven't even worked for one day in their lives uh, as they were waiting in Turkey because they either, you know, had support from NGOs or had financial support from their families. And then we really have like different um, conditions of waiting.
Do we have anyone else? Well, it looks like everybody's asked all of their questions. Um, I want to thank Elif Sari for joining us today. I want, I want to thank you for being part of the Queer and Trans Research Lab in general and teaching for the Sexual Diversity Studies Program and also for sharing this work with us. Thank you very, very much. I want to thank um, Nikolai Atai as well for moderating um, the Q&A. And I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight for this really wonderful conversation. Um, so take good care, everybody. Um, and thank you once again. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I really enjoyed this conversation.